Welcome to another edition of Inside the War Room. Ryan Ray here, as always. Thank you so much for tuning in. Today's guest is Mel Ayton, historian of assassins, which is a pretty cool, pretty cool job that maybe I want to pick up in the future. It sounds like it's fun to study the assassins, especially of the 60s, which is when we had in the U.S. at least a ton of assassinations going on. Um, today's show is about Sirhan Sirhan. If you listen, you will realize pretty quickly that I do not know a lot about this topic, which is why I reached out to Mel to get him on the program as Sirhan Sirhan will be released from prison very soon if he hasn't already. I had to go check the dates on that. Um, regardless, Mel is um, a great guest and we're very thankful that he came on. I will link to his website, the article is referenced in the show notes and um, his Amazon book page. He's got a new book coming out here in the States in November and then in the UK, I think it's coming out at the end of September. So be sure to check that out. Ryan Recommends is our sponsor today, which is Ridge Wallet. I've had the Ridge Wallet for over uh, maybe two months, month and a half. I don't know. It's been some time. And I've actually liked it. I didn't think I would. Uh, I got the red and black graphite, I think is what it was. But I really do like it. It's, it's small. It's compact. It does exactly what I need to do, which is to stay out of my way. So I really enjoyed that wallet. I'll link to it below. If you want to support the show, be sure to check out the folks at the Ridge Wallet. My only complaint is I hope the red would stick out a little bit more on my desk so I could see it. I have a cluttered desk because I have a cluttered mind. I think that's how the saying goes. So anyways, be sure to check that out. Without further ado, let's get to our guest, Mel Aiton. <coughs> Mel, it is lovely to have you on the show today. How are you doing? I'm fine. And you, Ryan? Uh, it, you know, it's kind of gloomy over here in Texas, but other than that, all is well. Um, so let's get into kind of a topic that Maybe if we didn't live in a COVID world, we'd get more attention. But the release of Sirhan Sirhan um, was announced, I guess it was last week. You obviously have a book about this topic, um, the RFK assassination. Um, so a lot to get into. But first, what was what drew you to this story to make you to make you write the book? Well, you know, as, a, as an historian, you can't be um, an expert in the history of the world. You can't be an expert in the history of America or of Britain, or of Europe, really. You have to narrow it down. You have to be a specialist. And so I specialized in the assassinations of the 1960s, mm. beginning with JFK, uh, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, and uh, finally Robert Ke Well, it wasn't finally Robert Kennedy, because I followed up by researching uh, after that. You had George Wallace. Uh, and then you had the attempts on Ford, and you had Hinckley. So really, uh, I, I developed my expertise in uh, American assassinations. And, and what's funny is is that the you know the Kennedy na name. So I'm 36, and so I remember when the Kennedy son died in the plane crash. Like that was kind of my first um, real. Kennedy moment, if you will. I think probably we'd learned the presidents before in school, but I, I remember that. Remember when that happened and, um, you know, his plane crash and trying to understand why he was such a big deal. And it, it's fascinating because the RFK story doesn't really seem to get the attention in the U.S. And you would think it might get more because it was the assassination of the second Kennedy within just a mere short period of time. And so any, any insight on why it doesn't have the same I don't know if cult-like following is the right word, but the same following as the JFK assassination does. Well, it doesn't have the same following as the JFK assassination because uh, <clears throat> the JFK assassination has been more muddied than the RFK assassination. And by that, I mean that the JFK assassination, in reality, one of the realities of the JFK assassination, that it was um, an easy crime to crack. But because of all of the conspiracy books and all of the conspiracy theories, that's the second reality. It's just muddied the waters so much that people are totally confused. When it came to the Robert Kennedy assassination, uh, the, you know, the, the theories didn't take off uh, as much as the JFK theories, but they nonetheless, they were there and they developed in the 1970s, 80s, and, uh, well, it's still going on. Yeah, and one of the things that I learned later on about the 
um, RFK assassination was Buck Compton was the prosecutor. And, um, it, and I learned that from watching the Band of Brothers TV show. And so it was kind of weird. Yes. That's because right. they kind of yes. become full circle because again I haven't it's not it's not a topic that I've that's that's in popular culture in the U.S. at least for my age group and so I love Band of Brothers I kind of watch that show about once a year I just think it's a great show and um and learning that Buck Compton was the prosecutor of Sir Hans Sir Hans is it's one of those just weird history tidbits. That's right. And of course, Lynn Compton uh, prosecuted that case uh, as an honorable man. Uh, what's coming out now is that uh, he wasn't honourable. And all of the accusations that have been bandied about have kind of sullied his reputation, but he was a really great guy. So let's go back to Sir Han Sir Han, um, his motivation, the access, maybe set the story for people who aren't familiar with it at all. They've kind of heard the name, they've heard the Noshev Cave brother, but what happened that day? What led up to it? Um, and in, in, in how did Sir Hans Sir Hans able to was, it, was he able to access RFK so close? Well, uh, he'd been stalking Robert Kennedy. Uh, there's plenty of evidence to show that. Sir Hans was a disaffected uh, Palestinian. He moved to the United States with his family when he was 12 years old. Shortly after that, he got pretty he pretty much had a chip on his shoulder about being a foreigner, about being. Uh, uh, an Arab, when he thought the Americans favored uh, the Israelis. Um, he became uh, vehemently uh, anti-Semitic. Uh, um, and he, he was also, combine that, that that's the, the political side. Combine that with the personal side. He was a loser. He wanted to be a jockey. He was no good at it. Uh, he was you know, pretty antagonistic towards any of his employees. John Widener, for example, said that uh, he was just so fanatical. Uh, he, he had a temper, as his brother Munir said. He had, uh, he wanted to, you know, he just absolutely hated Jews, uh, whether they were in Israel or the United States. And being a loser in life, and this is the commonality with assassins, you know, they tend to be losers. Uh, they are nobodies who want to be somebodies. So Sir Han had it in his mind that he wanted to be the second uh, Kennedy assassin. He wanted to make a name for himself. He hadn't succeeded at anything else. And he was also uh, violently uh, anti-Semitic. And, and uh, after the Six Day War in 67, when it came up to the anniversary of the, of, of the war a year later, that's the time when Robert Kennedy won the California primary in the 1968 presidential elections. Uh, <clears throat> he decided uh, he was going to be the second Kennedy assassin. So he stalked him and he used every opportunity uh, to get near to Kennedy. And uh, he shot him in the pantry of the Ambassador Hotel on Wil Wilshire Boulevard in Los Angeles. Uh, now, so now you mentioned, real quick, you mentioned the anti... You mentioned the anti-Semitic thing. Then the Kennedys were Catholics, right? So, what, what's the connection with him being an anti-Semitic person and the Kennedys? Because I'm not, not I'm not following the the connection well, there. First of all, he wasn't a Muslim Palestinian. Uh, a lot of people get confused about this. His family were Christians. You know, there's a large proportion of Palestinians who follow the Christian faith. But for Sirhan, he what? It's it's wrong to call him a Christian Palestinian because he was, uh, he abandoned his faith uh, when he was a teenager and, you know, the first four years of his twenties, he was, uh, he looked to the, the occult uh, for answers to his failed life. Uh, the Rosicrucians, uh, for example, he, he, he wanted to join them. Um, so really he, he, he was an atheist. So, right. So, but so, so what is the anti, I guess maybe I'm not, I'm not connecting here. Does he, does he think that the, that Kennedy was going to promote some kind of Jew, uh, pro Israel policy as some kind of pro, um, um, uh, maybe more favor to, to, to the Jews? What, what was that in his mindset and how does well, that? Okay. Kennedy? I, I think, you know, basically it was, he wanted to be the second Kennedy assassin. He was definitely pro-Palestinian, anti-Jewish, 
Uh, he was uh, so angry about the situation. He felt alienated in American society. So that's the main reason. But uh, he did hear uh, speeches by Robert Kennedy advocating sending arms to Israel. But, you know, he used that as an excuse. I think, you know, if he hadn't heard these speeches, he would have still, fed. he would have found out uh, eventually that uh, Kennedy, you know, was pro-Israeli. Right. And maybe just for the standpoint of this the historical standpoint, um, obviously, the, what was going on in Israel, you, you kind of touched on it a little bit, it was a lot different back in the, the 60s and 70s than it, than it was today. So what was kind of going on in that portion of the world? Because we're coming out of World War II, it's relatively close, the new Israel state. Um, and so you have the what the Seven Day War, whatever it was. There's, there's a lot going on in, in the Middle East. At yes, that period yes, time. There was. Yeah. Uh, you, you obviously you hit on it there. You know the the, the state of Israel, uh, 1948. Uh, um, there was a lot of uh, fighting going on in a, a kind of a small way. There were terrorist acts. Al Fatah was formed in the early 60s. Yasser Arafat, the head. Uh, they were having incursions uh, from Jordan. The West Bank belonged to Jordan at the time, or was r run by Jordan. Um, so there were incursions into Israel, uh, there were terrorist attacks, and uh, that occurred in the few years before uh, Sirhan shot uh, Robert Kennedy. And he supported these. There is lots of evidence, uh, quite a few witnesses to, uh, you know, see Sirhan as a pro-Palestinian supporter of violent means for political change. So you mentioned, let's go back to the stalking for a second there. You said he, he kind of followed him, he stalked him. Um, one of the things I've been doing on a lot of the podcasts, we talk about geopolitics a lot, and I've talked about, I kind of use the 1960s as a good reference because technology information, access information was so different back then. And I, I kind of point out that, well, you know, um, what you could get away with in the 60s, you can't today necessarily because of cell phones and live streaming and videos and, you know, whatever. Um, but now we have a case where, in the 60s, a man is stalking another man um, with limited access to resources as far as newspapers, television coverage, radio coverage. So how did he go about stalking him? Um, how, um, and how successful was he at you know, getting close to Kennedy before the assassination? Like everyone in the 60s, TV and newspapers, uh, Kennedy uh, heard that uh, Robert, uh, sorry, Sirhan heard that Robert Kennedy was giving a speech in San Diego. He was giving a speech in uh, the Ambassador Tell on the Sunday, uh, and it was well publicized. He would be there on election night. Uh, so, you know, it wasn't hard to follow uh, uh, Kennedy's, uh, uh, you know, um, trips. Yeah, I guess maybe that's the, the inverse. But another point as well, Ryan, I, I, I must raise this. To, getting back to the, the 1968, the time of the shooting, most Americans didn't know what a Palestinian was, uh, which is why even journalists didn't, because they called him an, uh, a Jordanian immigrant. They didn't know anything at the time about his uh, uh, Palestinian fanaticism. Uh, uh, and so it was lost. You know, they, they just described him as a crazy person. Uh, but he did have political reasons uh, to kill Kennedy. Right. Yeah. yeah. And so you talking about that makes me think of the, the kind of the inverse of what I've been saying is also true, which is if today we are so dispersed over media, you know, when Trump was traveling around and Biden was going to go around back in the last um, election cycle, it was kind of you really had to be keen to figure out where they were going and really had to be following the election because there's so much going on in the world. But I guess back in the 60s, because there was less news coverage um, for, uh, as far as the, the number of entities, well, you didn't have the 24-hour news cycle, of course. Right, yeah. right. And so they would they would probably focus on those stories, which would make that actually easier to track um, if you're kind of a dissident loser, as you as you put it. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, and, and but, so do, do, uh, do we have any in, insight on when Sir Han first kind of got the idea that he wanted to assassinate Kennedy, um, how far after the JFK assassination that they come about? Um, or was it when he just started to run? Any, any insight on that? Well, he, he read a lot about the JFK assassination. Um, he also, uh, he, he was a failed college student at Pasadena College. Uh, 
Uh, and they found out later than library books, he'd underlined certain passages uh, which dealt with assassination. Uh, the, the evidence is just overwhelming, which is just uh, so surprising that they say he was a, uh, a mild-mannered, mild-tempered guy uh, who had no violent streak. Uh, he, he, he certainly did have a violent streak. One of the things when you when you see kind of a, maybe um, a serial a serial killer come to the forefront or an assassin, as you mentioned, by and large they are kind of isolated. Um, I think calling them losers is a proper thing to to, to, to label them because they are by and in fact losers. Um, but it, it, it's weird because they people go, oh wow, I never would have would have thought. This was about this is who that person was. And I've often wondered how much of that is kind of almost revisionist instant history because you didn't want to acknowledge the fact that there were these tendencies in this person that maybe should have raised a little bit more of alarm early on that you kind of let go. Absolutely. I mean, you've hit the nail on the head there, right? Quite a lot of assassins of, of the past have exhibited those types of behavior meek looking mild looking uh, allegedly uh, non-violent uh, you you look at the way that Hinckley uh, uh, displayed himself you look at the way that Mark Chapman with the John Lennon assassination uh, and also quite a number of assassins they were described in this way uh, John Douglas the FBI profiler uh, speaks of that in in his books about uh, uh, killers. So, what what do you think um, in Sir Hans Bond? Because um, you know, as, as we talked about, it's kind of an up close assassination. It's not like the you know the book depository. Uh, was he wanting to get caught? Was he thinking he could escape? Um, because it, you know, it's when you watch some of these things happen. Um, you, you if you're there's kind of the the horrific side of, of what's actually happening on screen, but then there's the just the analytical side that goes, okay, well, what was this person thinking? Were they just deranged, or did they have more methodical? So, did, did Sir Han Sir Han did he want to be captured and venerated, or did he think he was going to go down in a, a blaze of glory? I think he probably thought that uh, he, he's, he was definitely going to carry out his act. He was stimulated by drink. He was drunk at the time that he shot uh, Robert Kennedy. Uh, by his own admission, he had four Tom Collins drinks. And he also said, you know, he didn't drink very much. Uh, that's not exactly true. You know, there's many a case that, that I found where he's, he's been in bars in the Pasadena, Los Angeles area where he has drank. But yes, I mean, he was fueled by alcohol. Um, uh, he, he was also, um, you know, determined... Uh, he was stalking. He's, the, the, there were so many incidents uh, during the time, the night of the shooting, where someone saw him, he's acting strange and things like that. But I think with most people, the last thing uh, that enters your mind is, uh, you know, that guy's going to shoot somebody. I mean, it happens all the time. Uh, people didn't know. He tried to get behind the stage. You know, he eventually ended up in the pantry, which was behind the stage. Uh, he asked people, "Was will uh, Robert Kennedy come this way?" Uh, he 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 practiced self hypnotism as well. I mean, the idea about being a Manchurian candidate is absolute nonsense. I mean, everybody from Mossad to the KGB to the CIA have tried that, and what conspiracy writers don't tell you is that they all failed. So. Um, you know, if people are hooked on this uh, Manchurian candidate assassin, I mean, they, they really uh, haven't read very much. So he was certainly, um, you know, he's certainly fanatical about wanting to do the act. And uh, But no, I mean, he had his pistol. He saw Kennedy and he started to shoot. He wanted to be a big shot. Uh, there you go. I mean, it happened. How common is it for assassins to be on alcohol or drugs or, or whatever when they go through the act? Well, not many, I suppose. Uh, I'm trying to search my mind for, uh, I don't uh, Mark Chapman, perhaps. Um, 
Oswald certainly not. Os Oswald wasn't a, a drinker. So no, I mean, you know, if 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 I look back, uh, it'll have to take me a while to, you know, to to try and remember. No, sure. You just mentioned that Sirhan was was kind of you know um, had you know a handful of drinks and was tipsy or borderline, you know, maybe maybe a little bit drunk. I was just curious if that was a mo or not because. Um, all the other things that you described there make sense, and they kind of have a dual meaning, right? So if you're at a celebrity event and you're like, oh, is the celebrity coming this way? Oh, can I see the celebrity? Oh, will the celebrity be here? That could just as easily, and most times, 99 out of 100 is a fan asking a question to get an insight, an autograph, a picture, et cetera, of, uh, of the celebrity. And so, it, but it's also, I can kind of see how it plays out the same which is it could have these evil intentions as well the oh, alcohol is interesting because um as we know from just general culture some people do very stupid things on alcohol they need the the um <laughs> the liquor to to kind of make them brave if you will so i didn't know if that was exactly some yeah. of this you call other other assassins yeah yeah they become six foot tall uh i mean sirhan uh yet another chip that he had on his shoulder was the fact that he was uh you know, he's a small man. So Sirhan, um, he's been in jail for, was it 40 years now, right, roughly? 53 years. Is it 53? Oh, okay. Well, yeah, I can't do math. Okay. Yeah, 53. Okay. So 53 years, and he's been kind of appealing this process, or, or not appealing, but go through the parole process is where he's at now, I believe. He gets out of parole um, and I know that there's a lot of controversy about some of the claims he's been making. You've alluded to it before. Um, what, what's what been going on with this case? And, and on the flip side of that, why doesn't it get the media coverage? Is it because of this kind of COVID and everything else going on? Because the Kennedys in the U.S., they're kind of like, you know, the old line, sex sales, Kennedy sale too, but this story hasn't sold for some reason. You're right, Ryan. Uh, look, the, the American people are fascinated with the Kennedys. Anything that the Kennedys do, they're interested in it. Uh, they're also um, fascinated with, uh, you know, the assassination of JFK. It's the biggest crime in the world. Uh, one day crime, that is. Um, so really, the, the reason why Sirhan has been trying, well it's, it's, well, it's simple. He's been trying to get out of prison. He's been trying to get parole. Uh, exactly like James Earl Ray, uh, who I'm writing about at the moment. Um, uh, fascinating figures. Uh, what do they do? They hire lawyers. What do the lawyers do? Well, you know what lawyers do. They'll try any way uh, to get the client off the hook. So uh, Sirhan's had a lot of lawyers over the last 53 years, uh, and they've all pushed the hypnotized assassin angle. Now, if they hadn't have done this all those years, if they hadn't started this off, Sirhan may have, may have gotten parole. He said he can't remember. Now, I can prove that that's an absolute lie. Um, and the person who first uh, proved that was uh, investigative journalist Dan Muldeer in his book, The Killing of Kennedy, way back in 1995. Now, one of Sir, and I'll tell you the story. One of Sir Han's investigators, a man called Michael McCowan, was sitting next to Sir Han during the trial, the 1969 trial. And he, he said, you know, uh, words to the effect, because um, Michael McCowan said, well, if he turned his head, Sir Han, why didn't you shoot uh, Bobby Kennedy between the eyes? And Sir Han said, because he turned his head at the last second. Now, Michael McCown kept all of his notes. He got Sirhorn to draw a map of the uh, area around the Ambassador Hotel. On that map, he points the people he met and spoke to. He says everything about his actions that night, and yet people aren't willing to I, I, really, it's incomprehensible that people still say he couldn't remember. There's absolute proof that he could remember. And oh, by the way, he has admitted it. But he always adds this point, if I did do it, uh, because I can't remember. 
Sirhan can remember without a doubt. So I guess I'm confused here. This is not, I have four kids. My oldest is 13. My youngest is two and I've got 11 and a five-year-old. Um, you know, this is not like talking to my five-year-old who can't remember, you know, what she did three days ago because she does 5 million things and some of them have consequence, some of them not. Um, this is a grown man committing a grown man act. Um, I'm not sure the relevance, you know, if I asked my five-year-old daughter, Hey, two weeks ago, when we went to someone's house, did you get an argument with your friend, right? She may or may not remember. And it's really hard to determine when she does and does it because she's five. Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, so, so yeah, you're right. It's, it's not that important. Uh, the importance is the ballistics evidence, uh, the ballistics evidence are absolutely, you know, uh, clear. There've been anomalies in the case. You had, uh, it's, they were trying to prove more than uh, eight shots were fired. Sir Hans Ivor Johnson only had, it, you know, it's an eight shot. Uh, there've been lots of uh, sort of anomalies in the case, but it's because if you've got a million people looking into one case, you'll find any, look, any murder investigation, there'll be mistakes. Absolutely. Uh, the They also ignore the most recent, I hired, uh, uh, the best acoustics firm in England to do the, there was a recording of the assassination, an audio recording. It's called the Brzezinski tape. So I hired uh, Peter French and associates in York, England to look at this. They did a thorough examination of the tape. They said, you know, there were, you know, less than eight shots seven or more there were eight look it's a bit complicated ryan they definitely found seven shots in the possibility of an eighth but no more and right? what you're what you're referencing there i think and because i heard someone this other day make a passing comment about this they said well they said uh, something to the effect of no one pays attention to the rfk stuff or the jfk stuff there's actually 15 shots on the tape i think that is that what you're referring to that, there, that some people claim that there's like 15 shot sounds is, well, is that 13 or 14 and it's a guy called van prague said there was his science is totally mistaken. You know, the JFK assassination, the audio, uh, the dicta belt of the Dallas police, you know, the, it took them, uh, they concluded that there was a fourth shot in the JFK assassination in Dallas uh, because they'd uh, got an acoustics firm, like I got an acoustics firm for the Robert Kennedy assassination, um, to examine the, the police dicta belt. It wasn't until 1982, that's three years after the uh, House Assassinations Committee published their report, that they just, the National Academy of Sciences discovered flaws in that report. So there you go. It's also ignored as well in the media. Ed Primo is an acoustics analyst. He released his findings, I think it was 2018 or 19. Uh, Ed Primo has used state of the art. I mean, up to date, it's used by the FBI. Eight shots. That's his conclusion. So the 13 and 14 shots is bogus. It's happened before the JFK assassination. Uh, it's just sort of incompetent research. Uh, I, I have faith in the acoustics experts that I hired. Okay, let's talk. About and by the way, I didn't uh, feed them information about what I was doing or my conclusions. Mm -hmm. They might have thought I was a conspiracy writer, and 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 right. perhaps altered their report for for me if I was a conspiracy. No, I, I didn't see anything about my research at all in terms of uh, where it was leading me to. That all of the conspiracy books are uh, bogus nonsense. Okay, um, let's talk about the conspiracy stuff for a second because I do want to pick your brain on this topic. So let me put my cards on the table here. Um, my, my general thesis on conspiracies is I'm happy to believe that there's bad people in the world. And I'm happy to believe that bad people conspire because that's essentially what conspiracy is. So con people conspiring to do stuff. 9-11, the what, okay, so I believe the official narrative about 9-11 that, you know, terrorists attack. That's a conspiracy though. The, the Taliban conspired yeah. to that, right? Oh. So, 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 um, I'm happy to entertain conspiracies in the in the sense that people conspire to do bad things all the time. People that we think are good, people that we're bad, all over the spectrum. The problem yeah. I have 
by and large, is that usually, usually the evidence that is presented by the conspiracy people is at least, at least able to be challenged at a substantive level by the other side. And so like to the, to the JFK assassination, I don't know, I'm, I'm, not, a, or I'm not an expert on any of this, but JFK I've seen a little bit more of. Um, you know, there's this whole thing about the bullet going in and hitting and dancing and all this stuff. And then I'm like, okay. And then, then I watched the video where the guy talks about how the, 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 the height right. seats in the seat in the cars. And I'm like, so wh- what I do when I hear that is I go, okay, I can't actually confirm the height of the seats because I don't, this guy could be making it up. Right. So, but, but if he's telling the truth, then obviously here's a plausible explanation to right. your thesis. You're so, talking about the, yeah, the, 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 the magic bullet. The magic bullet has been destroyed by leading experts who've used computer science. Now, one of the things that they get wrong, the conspiracy writers, they don't get the plan of the car right. Governor Connolly was sitting six inches in from JFK right. Right. in terms of lining up the bullet from the sixth floor of the book deposit. But right. they don't do that. Uh I spent, uh, uh, it was only, it was short time, it was an hour, when Arlen Inspector, he was one of the leading lawyers of the Warren Commission, I spent an hour with him in Washington, D.C. Uh, he put me on the right path to a lot of what the conspiracy writers uh, were doing to the case. Uh, and they were taking things out of context. They were using speculation, rumor, innuendo, uh, and, and and they great did great damage to the to, to the case. The same thing is happening with the Robert Kennedy assassination. And that uh, I think that I think that's incredible cool. thing. I mean, for yeah. example, uh, there's a conspiracy writer called Lisa P. She's in cahoots with RFK Jr. RFK Jr. knows nothing about this case. Trust me. Lisa P. Uh, has described Sir Hard as a mild mannered, lovely fellow. Well, he might be now after 53 years, but he certainly wasn't in 1968. And I've compiled a litany of people, uh, trial transcripts, interviews. I've, I've, I've compiled it all. And the picture, including his brothers, by the way, who described Sir Han accurately, uh, bad-tempered, uh, sulking, chip on his shoulder, uh, all kinds of things like that. You never hear this stuff in conspiracy books. And they've all testified that uh, he was far from being what Lisa Pease describes as a non-violent guy. This is how they distort the truth. Right. It's one of many ways. I mean, there's dozens of ways. It's, it, you know, if your listeners want to go to www.melayton.com, you know, I, all my articles are on there. Uh as well as um, interviews, uh, you know, throughout the United States. Um, so, you know, just act. I, all I do is tell people, look, read the science, read the evidence, read the reliable evidence. Don't read, don't take speculation into account. No, absolutely. And I think the point about the, um, the situation of the car and all that for the JFK stuff, I remember hearing that going, okay, this person could be making up everything about the logistics inside the car. I can't, I, I mean, Ryan Ray can't physically go see the car. I can't prove it. I have to believe someone. And so until someone disputes the locations of the people in the car, that seems to be the most plausible way they're sitting. And if they're sitting that way, then the bullet's not a magic bullet. And, and the computer conspiracy- with the correct, you know, right. um, plans, the correct plans right. of dealing with the plaza, the correct plans of the limousine, uh, you have computer experts who've actually, without a doubt, Dale Myers, for example, I think he, he lives in Dallas, Ryan. Uh, I, I'm not sure whether he's still alive, but Dale Myers, his, his computer sim- simulation, absolutely perfect. Explains the magic bullet. Absolutely. And by the way, it wasn't undamaged. <laughs> you know, people say, conspiracy writers say, an undamaged bullet went through you know, the Kennedy's neck, Kennedy's back, exited his neck, went through Connolly's back, exited his right nipple, then it went into his wrist and then ended up in his leg. They And then it did this zigzag because of the position. It's all bogus. And the sooner people really 
just, uh, it, 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 as I said before, Ryan, it's incomprehensible what conspiracy theorists can do to a case. They can distort it beyond belief. No, I, I agree. And my frustration with the conspiracy folk is not that they want to find conspiracies because they exist. It's that, first off, the JFK assassination alone or the RFK assassination, that is a, that is a conspiracy. Like the fact that Sirhan you know, went to do this, that is like that's a conspiracy. Like that's he's conspired to go kill a presidential candidate. Um, and no, he didn't conspire, conspire with anyone. Um, well, I know mean, one but, person who, no, no, who no, no, should no, have yeah, been arrested. I, 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 well, okay. Yeah, I, I'm saying he can right. he can inspire with himself. If the, I'm not, yeah, I'm not saying he can inspire other people, but I'm saying like that that like the the story is the Sirhan Sirhan. We don't have to go chase the tangents. Um, that that's the that is the that is the story itself. And so, right. um, and so you know why these things are happening though, Ryan? <laughs> why is that? Look, it's quite you know it, it it's not rocket science. It's money. It's ha- exactly, absolutely. I remember my agent when I sent the manuscript to the forgotten terrorist mm-hmm. to my agent she looked a bit downhearted about it <laughs> and i knew what she was thinking she wanted me to find a conspiracy right mm-hmm. why simple it's big money in the united states it really is people make a name for themselves just like william pepper who's made a name for himself not only defending sir Han, but uh, still you know, his recent book, book was published just 2018 or 19, uh, defending James L. Ray, uh, when four investigations, you know, have, have concluded, you know, James L. Ray acted alone in killing King, but with the proviso, and I'll get back to the RFK case in, in a second about this, with the proviso that his two brothers should have been indicted. Absolutely because they helped them before and after the act. Now, you might call that a conspiracy, but it's really not a conspiracy in the conventional sense. Sure. It's not the CIA and the government and the military um, banding together to to kill a leader. Well, Getting back to the RFK case, same uh, thing. Munir was the first one to to get the gun, the pistol, the Ivor Johnson 2-2. So... He was he was caught up in lies about purchasing the gun, so in a way he was part. Uh, he, he helped his brother Serhan. Well, I think you know the thing that that you that you find when you study these stories. Going back to Band of Brothers, there's a story in there where um, Lieutenant Spears they're at pinned down at Foley, and he runs through the city, tells the other side uh, the that's outflanked, you know, hey guys, we need to do this, and he runs back through. Both, you know, right in the middle of the Germans is firing. They never hit him. I'm like, that can't be real. That can't be real. There's no way that story's real. It's like a Rambo scene. You yeah. look up, it's actually real. Like, he actually ran to the city. Germans are firing, and he never got hit somehow. So twice. The, and so that's a truth is stranger than fiction story. And that's yeah. a, it's, it's a, it's a, to use a word, beautiful story. It's a story that you go, wow. I don't, I don't know how it happened. I don't understand the odds, but, but let's just appreciate that story and dissect it and understand it and the ramifications of it or, or whatever you want to do. And so when you look at the, the conspiracy folks, my, my, my challenge to them is you spend a lot of time trying to find stuff, just unpack what happened because what unhap what, what, what happened is probably would blow our minds or would entertain us enough, if you will, or would capture the imagination because truth a lot of times is, is stranger than fiction, how it works out because yep. you know you have these people who are living these lives and they decide to commit this heinous act. And it's, it's a very strange story. It's a very weird story. And, and maybe part of that is because in the books, the, the, um, the villains are all like, you know, Lex Luthor, you know, they're, they're mastermind criminals. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah, in real life, full of drama small. and intrigue, you know. Yes, of course. Um, but no, often it happens. You have a nobody who wants to kill a somebody because that infamy rubs off. Exactly. No, I think that's I think that's well put. Okay. You mentioned you have a book coming out or you're working on a book. When will that roughly be at? Do you have a date yet for that? Well, it, my next book, um, I'm, I'm trying to think of this, the 2019 edition of The Forgotten Terrorist, uh, with a forward by Alan Dershowitz, was uh, released in 2019. 
uh, and and I was so great. Alan Dershowitz asked my publishers because he liked the book if uh, he he you know it was okay if he could write the forward, uh, which he did, uh, which, which is fantastic. Um, so the next one is coming out this month. It's called Protecting the Presidential Candidates from JFK to Biden. So that's like Hunting the President, uh, my 2014 book. Um, I reveal lots of stories that are unknown to the general public about assassination attempts, about security around presidents and presidential candidates. Okay, well, I would love to get you back on when that comes out, because I read the book uh, Zero Fail about the Secret Service that came out during the summer. Um, I did I too. Yeah. Yes. So um, when your book comes out in November, let's see, November. No, it come, oh, it's in November in America. Yeah. So, sorry, in, in England, it comes out uh, the end of this month. Okay. So when it comes out at the end of November, um, I'd love to get you back on in December when I get a time, chance to dissect it. And would love to uh, chat about that. Thank you for coming on. This is kind of short notice. You were quick to respond. And so I appreciate that. Uh, we will send people to your website. Anywhere else in particular? Your Amazon page, obviously, for your books. Where else? Uh, also, you know, I'd like to mention um, recent stories. Do a Google search about the parole hearing and uh, RFK Jr.'s involvement, mm -hmm. uh, where he calls Sir Hart a sweet man. Uh, well, yeah, all right. <laughs> so there are things like that. Uh, Google uh, also Dan Muldeer. Now, you know, I, uh, clearly I, I had some great reviews for The Forgotten Terrorist, but I do say that I'm standing on the shoulders of giants. Uh, investigative journalist Dan Muldeer, who lives in Washington, D.C. Oh, I, I met up with him. Two, two thousand. We've been friends for years, but we'd only emailed. So I met up with him in 2018 in Washington, D.C. And it was there uh, during our meal that we spoke to the alleged second gunman, Dane Eugene Caesar, who was totally innocent and it is disgraceful for Robert Kennedy to make his accusations that he was the real killer. It is not true. Okay. So I think you sent me some articles. I will link to those in the show notes for the listeners to go check out. We'll link to your website, to your Amazon book page as well. And look forward to your next book, which is coming out here in the States. We do have listeners in the UK, but here in the States, it's coming out on November 30th. And it's called Protecting the Presidential Candidates from JFK to Biden. And that is, of course, on Amazon and wherever good books are sold. So thank you so much for your time today. Listeners, we'll be back real soon.